Hello, everyone. Um, this is Joel Fewer. Um, I'm the executive director of the Little Milken Institute, as I believe all of you know, or most of you know. Um, today, we have a, a really special uh, program for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we're right on top of things with the uh, latest news in connection with um, what we're calling the curious case of GameStop. Um, I have been following this since the beginning. I think it's a really interesting um, set of circumstances that is very useful. I always tell people that when I started practicing law, I did not know anything about the stock market. I had never owned a share of stock. I don't believe anyone in my family, even my extended family had ever owned a share of stock. Um, and I became a securities litigator. Um, uh, and I had to learn a lot about how Wall Street works and how the market works. And this, I think this, the curious case of GameStop is a way of actually learning a tremendous amount about how the market works and its different elements. Um, and of course it has a whole cultural overlay. So I wanted to make sure that we had a, con a conversation about it. And we are very, very fortunate uh, at UCLA Law School to have uh, two just outstanding uh, 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 scholars in the uh, securities area, uh, both of whom are professors at the law school. Professor James Park, who is also co-faculty director of the Lowell Milken Institute, and our, one of our newest professors, Andrew Burstein, uh, who um, is also um, a leading uh, voice in securities and other areas. So I'm just gonna turn it over to them. They said they didn't need a moderator and I'm sure they don't and just let them go to it. We're going to have some um, time uh, uh, at the end, I hope for questions. So um, I will do my best if you put things in the chat or when we get to questions, raise your hand and I'll make sure you get called on. All right, so Professors Park and Verstein, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Joel. So I'm going to start off by talking to people about some key events, just so that we're all on the same page of the basic plot line. Uh, it's uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, hard to decide what the key events are in a curious case like this, but we'll uh, I'll put a few things up on the screen. Then I'll hand it over to Professor Park to talk about um, some possible explanations for what has happened and some implausible explanations. Uh, I think that's what Professor Park will work on. Then I'll go uh, to, again to talk about some of the legal implications of things that are going on. And then the both of us will get together for policy implications. Of course, we believe and hope and want to have a lot of good time for questions and discussion. Looking at the list of people in the room, it's some great people, students, alums, professors. I would love to hear what you guys have to say and what is interesting to you. And one thing that I think is fascinating about this case is because it, it's that it draws so many feelings. People have uh, political interpretations of this, economic interpretations, conspiracy theories that are utterly wild. And uh, we may get a chance to talk about a few of those things. So our goal is at, at, at some shallow to medium level of, uh, of granularity to talk about what is going on just so we're all on the same page and then we can get a good discussion going. So the key events, and by the way, um, you know, this is, uh, this is Zoom and uh, if you're not that familiar with Zoom, you can raise your hand to ask questions. You can use a chat feature. Uh, I don't think that um, either of us are gonna be necessarily attending to that in real time, but we will look at that from time to time. And if you wanna get a question in the chat window or raise your hand, we can make sure that we get to you in an, you know, in an orderly way. Um, Okay, so uh, here are some key events. Here's a, here's a little price chart I pulled down. Of course, this thing is already totally inaccurate because I pulled it down a couple of days ago, but here's the, the GameStop uh, uh, price uh, as, as pulled down from, uh, from Yahoo Finance. And uh, you know, GameStop, as you guys know, is a, a mall retailer, a real retailer of video games. And uh, if you had said, uh, let me tell you how Mall, re uh, mall video games are going to go over the last couple of months. This may not be the price chart you would have expected. Um, and uh, so what do we have here? Uh, now, I, I'm only putting four pairs of double arrows up here, and I don't claim that these are the authoritative four points, but here are some things to think about. Um, uh, back in August, it was, uh, it was covertly disclosed that uh, one prominent hedge fund had shorted uh, GME stock. They didn't actually say that, but you could, you could back that out uh, of their filings. You could figure out that they'd done that. And about that time, GameStop was uh, trading at about $4. You know, a little higher, a little lower, 
kind of in that range. You say, oh, well, are they, are they picking on it because it's little? Are they making it go down? Anyway, that's what happens back in August and September. Uh, and then another note that you might make is that, you know, some people begin to praise uh, GameStop, uh, including um, Ryan Co Cohen, who I guess was associated with the uh, with Chewy Corporation or something. And, and you know, maybe, maybe that's good news and uh, it's going to get better as time goes on because the stock price is going to go up a little bit. Well, then some other people start to praise it. And I'm tagging this kind of point for where Redditors uh, uh, praise it, you know, that's an online message board sort of a system. You know, I think the Redditors in the room uh, would, would say, oh, no, we were praising it before this. Yeah, fine, fine. But this is a very salient moment of where everybody gets really excited about it and begins to urge each other to buy stock and, and buy stock. And the price goes really high. And then, you know, some other stuff happens, like Robinhood halts buying for a for a short period of time and, and the stock plummets. And you know, when I last checked, it was it closed at like $63. Uh, so that's a very curious series of events. Uh, it cries out for an explanation. And, um, and by the way, can I just get a, just for fun, uh, are you guys able to either click yes or click a thumbs up if you are a person who is engaged in any buying or selling of GameStop in the last couple of weeks? Can you just put that in there? Um, just for fun, so we know, you know, so we know what we're all up to. And I. Uh, I'll disclose to you that I haven't bought or sold any GameStop, except insofar as I'm a mutual fund investor and my mutual funds may be, uh, may be up, to, up to things. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. A, little, a, little, a few takers. In my contract law class, I ask students to disclose a contract they have entered into in the last week or so. And the number two answer for my 80-person contract class was uh, bought GameStop stock through Robinhood. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of action as, as you as you no doubt know. Um, okay, uh, so what has gone on here? Before I hand it over uh, to Professor Park to talk about some more, I want to I want to bear the burden of talking for a minute about what these short sellers are because uh, what they are, who they are, how they work is deeply mis mysterious to most people and generates controversy and misunderstanding. And for you know, apologies for any of this if you're already quite deep into the weeds, but I I still think it warrants for for many people a refresher. Um, so what are short sellers? Uh, well, they are folks who uh, are betting that a stock will go down. Uh, this, uh, the key things to know about it, uh, one is that it's quite risky. So if you bet a stock will go up, you might be right, and then you'll make some money. Like if the stock starts at four and goes to uh, 40, you could make $36. Uh, so, uh, but if you, uh, uh, if you um, uh, bet that it'll go down, uh, and it goes to 40, you could lose $36. In fact, you can lose an unlimited amount when you're a short seller uh, as, a, as a theoretical matter because the stock could go up forever and you'd lose money every minute of that. And all that just for the limited upside, that is you could make at most $4 from your $4 short. It could go down to zero and then you'd have made $4 because you correctly predicted the decline and $4 ain't nothing, but it ain't unlimited downside that you're facing. So it's a risky business. It's not for those who are faint of heart. It's deeply controversial as well. Um, as you know from following these stories, people have very strong, usually negative opinions about short sellers. And they, they have for uh, as long as we've had short selling. The uh, short selling has been extensively regulated or banned for probably the majority of American uh, financial history. So it is, uh, it is frequent that statutes and administrative rules are deployed to inhibit free, uh, short selling for lots of reasons. It's, it's uh, kind of unpatriotic to you know, bet that a company, a good American company is gonna go out of business or have a hard time. That's not very, it's not very friendly. And uh, there's also a sentiment that maybe that is uh, part of why they go out of business is the short sellers beat up on them and pile up on them. And they have an incentive to bankrupt them as best they uh, can. Uh, so they'll spread lies about them or engage in market manipulation. So whenever a company has a hard time, they uh, claim that they have been the victim of a, of, a, of a bear raid or short sellers who are trying to pillage them. And there may be some truth to that, but it's probably not as true as people think it is. Um, a, a final thing to note, and you know, this is gonna be something we'll maybe return to, is that short sellers, for all their controversy, do perform useful functions. Uh, they are, uh, you can think of a short seller as a person who is trying to pop a bubble. You can think of a short seller as a person who is a investigative journalist who is paid by the truth of their claim. You know, you, walk, you work for the Wall Street Journal, you write true columns, you might win a Pulitzer, you might uh, 
be a, a sought after journalist, you might get a raise. But if you instead uh, publish your reports as, um, uh, as, as PDF files placed on Reddit, after you've shorted the stock, you could make millions of dollars from your investigative journalism. And uh, that is a way that investigative journalism gets done under the, under the heading of short selling. And so uh, 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 the Luck and Coffee franchise was, was famously uh, a fraud that they'd inflated their revenues by 30%. And it was discovered by just thousands and thousands of people walking around coffee shops in China, checking to see whether the sales could possibly square up and documenting that they couldn't that amount of investigation wasn't going to be done by the Wall Street Journal. And so short selling helps to finance some of these operations. Again, I think reasonable minds may differ about the proportion uh, of good and bad performed by short selling, but uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that it elicits uh, interest in both. Um, how does it work mechanically? Well, you know, in a, in a simpler world, you would just go to um, a racetrack and bet, you know, uh, a crown royale to win and a snow puck to place and uh, also GME to go out of business. You would just bet to bet that it would go down, but you can't do that. That's, that's not what puritanical Americans will allow. Even though you can do it in the United Kingdom, you can walk into a Ladbrokes and pay, place a, a bet on a football match and a bet on a race and a bet on a stock. And those contract tracks for difference are perfectly legal in much of the world, but we don't do that. So we make you do it in a kind of cockamamie way if you want to bet against a stock. And here's how you do it. I'm going to proceed first by analogy and then change the words to make it uh, not what? an analogy. I take a and I think, Jennifer, you may be unmuted. So I'm going to mute you real quick. Do you want to go back? There we go. Great. So uh, suppose you owned a coat. It's worth $100. You know, it's a nice little J. Crew coat, and you were able to get it uh, for $100. And there are plenty more like it. And you go to the Ritz Carlton, check it at the coat check. You know what the Ritz does? It rents it to me. And that's what I'm wearing right now. Okay, um, that's not behavior that we expect of the Ritz-Carlton uh, because there's an understanding with bailments that you're supposed to retain the property, not enrich yourself by the holding, not send it to third parties, but they could rent it out. And if they were to rent it out, they could rent it out to me, make a little money. And then I, as the owner of a rented coat, could go and sell it to somebody. And uh, that would also be strange behavior in the coat context because we tend to think that people shouldn't rent or borrow things and then sell them. I'm going to have to return it in a few hours. What, what is it going to look like when I have sold it? We might even call it theft or conversion if I were to do this. Uh, but I could get away with it if I go and buy it back, maybe from Raging Kitty, maybe from J. Crew. I can get another one that looks just like it and no one will be the wiser. And, uh, you know, I'm I might actually do well by this. If J. Crew has a sale and I'm able to buy it for $70, I can return a perfectly nice coat that looks just like the one I borrowed and I can keep $30 for my trouble. Of course, it's also possible that J. Crew will discontinue the coat and I can only get one on eBay and on eBay it's $347. So I take the $100 I got from Raging Kitty and I have to pony up 247 more in order to uh, in order to get that coat. And then I return it to the Ritz and think, wow, that was terrible, but it could have been worse. Um, by the way, uh, you know, Raging Kitty might have taken my coat to the Ritz and gone to the very same soiree as you did and checked it there. And Raging Kitty's uh, coat, uh, which is your coat, might be uh, rented out by the Ritz to Professor Park too who then will sell it to someone else who will go to the soiree and check it. And the same coat could be the basis of dozens and dozens of rental sale repurchase transactions uh, and, uh, and wonders never cease. So this is an analogy that would seem quite strange with coats, but it is in fact what we do for short selling stock. And so here's how it works for stock. Instead of a coat, it's a stock. And you take your stock and you bring it not to the Ritz Carlton Hotel, you bring it to your broker, Robinhood. In fact, you bought it through Robinhood, your broker. You went to Robinhood on the app and you put $100 into stock. And Robinhood said, Great, we have a stock share for you. It's in your account. Here's your brokerage statement. And Robinhood will rent it out, just like the Ritz Carlton did. They will lend it out for money to someone, to, to me. And I can buy it and I can sell it to Raging Kitty. And again, 
I'm going to have to make good on that at some point. I'm going to have to get another share back. Um, but as long as I'm able to get it at a reasonable price, I will come out ahead. And so I functionally bet the stock price will go down. And I have functionally exposed myself to the risk that the stock price will go up. Okay. And just like with the coat, that same share that I sell could be brought back to the brokerage and lent out again and sold again and borrowed again and sold again and borrowed and sold. And this is part of why you're able to have a short position that, uh, that, that you can have short positions that exceed the number of shares. More people can short shares than there are shares because the same shares can be the basis for multiple shorts. It's wild. It's weird. This is a Byzantine way to bet against a company, but it's the American way. And so this is what short selling is. In many cases, the ways that it's functionally identical to just betting um, uh, uh, predominate. Though we, uh, we may see that in this case, um, the weird features of how American short selling operates uh, can be quite important because uh, they will make it possible for a squeeze to take place. And if I understand correctly, um, uh, Professor Park will talk about that in a moment. One, one or, yeah, so yeah, my, my point here is this is quite a wacky way to bet against something. It is a wacky thing that, the, that, the, that our market, uh, uh, that short selling is the way that we bet against things. One more terminological note, um, when you read the stories, you'll, you'll hear uh, that, you know, Main Street beat the Wall Street hedge funds on this one. And it is the case that short sellers are hedge funds in this case. The two big short selling firms that uh, were beating up GME were hedge funds. Uh, but um, it, it's not the case that all hedge funds are short sellers, nor that, um, uh, nor that you have to be a hedge fund to short sell something. So these are, these are vague terms that are... Um, that are, that are um, often uh, misused. And all we mean by hedge fund when we use those terms are investment companies that aren't subject to the same kinds of regulation as your ordinary mutual fund. And so they're able to engage in a wider variety of investment projects, including short selling, I mean, which is a risky and kind of sophisticated activity. Um, your mutual fund, your Vanguard index fund is not doing a lot of short selling, but hedge funds have that as an option, even though most hedge funds are, are not extensively involved in that. Um, that I, I think that terminological clarification is important as we begin to ask who are winners and who is an active player in the story. We don't want to say hedge funds were just on one side of the story. There are hedge funds all over the story, hedge funds under every rock you turn over. All right. So my intention is to now cede the floor to Professor Park. Does that seem okay, Professor Park? Sounds great, Andrew. Thanks very much. I will share my screen as well. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, first, thank you to Joel for, uh, for thinking of this event and, and organizing it. It's uh, great also to have, have Andrew uh, uh, on board and, and participating in, in our events. Um, you know, the GameStop case, it, it reminds me a little of, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I had a friend uh, who was a paralegal um, at, a, at a law firm, and, and he sort of had the side business of uh, investing in internet stocks. And, and for those of you old enough to remember the first internet bubble, you remember how um, there are all these uh, obscure companies losing lots of money uh, that were doubling and tripling in price. And you know, he told me that the partners at this firm, which is one of the top five firms in the country, would come to him for investment advice. And, and that's kind of, um, there's some similarities, I think, with uh, the position we find ourselves in, in now where, um, you know, the, it's, it's sort of the amateurs uh, who, who may get it more than, uh, than, than sort of the more experienced investors who are uh, more, more conservative. And uh, it's, uh, and it's, it's, this happens, right? It happens uh, on a cyclical basis. And, and I think it rests on uh, just the reality that a stock price essentially is, is a guess. It's, it's a guess about, um, you know, what is the uh, present value of the company's future earnings? Uh, what is the company going to earn in the future? And while experts may have an edge in determining um, what that value might be, um, sometimes uh, ordinary individuals uh, may uh, you know, may have a, just as good of a chance of predicting the future as uh, the experts. 
Um, so in, in sort of thinking about events, I want to emphasize that, you know, the story has not yet been completely told. There's a whole bunch we just don't know. Um, and we may never know exactly what happened uh, with respect to GameStop and why its stock price uh, basically went crazy for a few days. Um, but I think, um, you know, as an initial question, I think the first question we should ask is, you know, what is GameStop worth? What, what is its value? Um, can we get a sense of how we determine that value uh, through more traditional means? And, um, you know, the first pay place I would rec recommend that you look if you're considering buying a stock, investing in a stock, is look up uh, the company's 10K, uh, the SEC disclosure that uh, the company is required to file on an annual basis. Um, you might look at the 10Q, which would be a little bit more, more recent. Um, and and this, this contains financial information that you can use to uh, get a sense of the company and its business and how the business has been uh, doing over, uh, over time. Um, so if you look at GameStop's 10K in 2020, and all of this is publicly available, um, it's all available on a website called Edgar, the Edgar website. And if you just Google that, you can uh, you, you, you can get to that website and type in the name of any public company and a whole bunch of entries will come out and you can kind of look through and find where the 10K and the 10Q uh, is. And uh, this is a part of the company's uh, income statement. And that's a, uh, a statement that basically uh, reports whether the company made a profit or a loss um, over a particular year. And we see with GameStop that they're doing pretty well in 2015, um, you know, profit of about $379 million. This is all in millions, but there's a downward trend. 2016, 304.5 million, 2017, it goes down more. And then you see these parentheses, which I always tell my securities regulation class is not a good thing because parentheses means a negative number. Uh, they lost about $800 million in 2018. They're doing a little bit better. They cut the loss a bit uh, in 2019, um, but they're losing money, right? This is a company that's losing money. Um, you know, that doesn't mean though it has a negative value that its equity is worthless because we might expect that these profits will recover over time. And that's, you know, certainly possible, although not certain by any means. Um, but, you know, suppose it gets back to $300 million at some point, $400 million in annual earnings. And if you do a rough you know, envelope calculations say, let's multiply that by 20. That's kind of a reasonable ratio between the company's earnings and its, its price. You'd get around $6 billion in terms of its market uh, capitalization. And that, that assumes everything goes right. And it again is churning out consistently about $300 million in earnings per year. Now you might think that, you know, the company may do even better. Maybe it gets up to five, six, you know, or, or, you know, 500, 600 million dollars, a billion dollars, and in which case you might think that the valuation is greater, but that's a big if, right? It's a big if, and it's not quite certain how they will uh, do this. Um, and, and so that's, that's essentially how you would get sort of a guesstimate about what the price of the stock should be, what the company's value uh, should be worth. And we see there's a lot of uncertainty about um, whether or not it's going to be profitable and what the level of profits will be. Um, so um, what happens on January 11th, as Andrew mentioned before, we have Ryan Cohen who comes in in the fall, takes a 9% stake in the company. And that's good news for GameStop, right? That is sort of a stamp of approval that a sophisticated investor who has been successful in the, in the past is willing to come in and make a major uh, investment in the company. And so um, so there are some kind of positive developments. And, and the positive development is he's on the board now. He you know, the, he's, has enough clout that you have three new directors who are basically on the board who, um, have, uh, uh, who, who, who could potentially help turn the company around. Um, and this is really kind of what gets things going, right? There is positive news. It, it is not entirely irrational to think that GameStop should be worth somewhat more with these new board members. Now, we all know, though, that, you know, boards have power, but that it's, it's limited, right? They, you know, they monitor management, uh, they can hire and fire managers, but, um, you know, is, is a single director, even a group of directors going to be able to come up with a, 
transformative strategy that's going to get this company profitable again? Lots of questions, lots of questions as to whether or not this really uh, would make a difference. Um, same press release, we get some numbers about how the company is doing. And there's some good news here, right? 5% increase in comparable store sales. Um, those are uh, you know, stores that have existed um, uh, over time. And so this, this is good news because it shows that the pandemic has not totally destroyed their business. Um, you might say, you know, 309% increase in e-commerce sales. That looks, looks really good. And I saw, saw a few comments on Reddit that kind of pointed to this. But, you know, keep in mind that this is a fledgling business. And so, you know, 300% of an increase on a very small amount is not necessarily a big deal. Um, they're starting out pretty small. There's sort of some bad news here, too, in that, you know, they're, they're suffering more uh, losses, total si sales declined 3%, driven by an 11% decrease in the company's store base. And that's, you know, that's their strategy, um, which they, they started implementing uh, in May of 2019 um, to really shrink their presence. And that, that's normally not a good driver of growth, right? This is, you know, this is kind of uh, acknowledging that the company's business is not as good as it is. It's not growing, it's not expanding with more stores. And so that is, is something that really cuts against a growth story that uh, you might want to tell uh, with, with respect to the company. Now, it doesn't mean it's, it's going to fail. It, it, you know, it could be that the remaining stores become much more profitable. Maybe they uh, stake out something in e-commerce, but you know, you're competing with Amazon right, in e-commerce and other, other, uh, a lot of players in that space. And, um, and so uh, still a lot of uncertainty as to what the results mean. And um, notably, uh, the management, uh, which has the best information about the company, um, they indicate that uh, everything's very uncertain. Everything's very uncertain. And um, during the pandemic, um, a lot of companies basically stopped saying, we're going we're gonna to stop issuing projections and forecasts of our performance because we just don't know what's going to happen. And uh, this statement, to me, um, you know, if, if management believed that there was a lot of excitement about the company, that would be something I would credit. But, you know, they, they, they seem, you know, it's not just the short sellers that aren't enthusiastic. The, the management itself uh, seems to be very cautious and is not really sure um, what exactly is going to happen with the company. So there's sort of a driver of this on January 11th. Um, and the stock price goes up pretty high. Um, and, you know, this... I started, you know, I, I ventured down the rabbit hole of Reddit for the first time. I've never seen it. And, you know, it's hard to navigate, I have to say. It reminds me of, uh, you know, the early bulletin boards in the 1980s that were posted. It's still the same format, just people posting messages. And, um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of these messages that I'm not sure how anyone has time to uh, sort through, through these. I hope our students, especially our Wendells, are not spending too much time on uh, on this, um, um, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, there are a few nuggets here, a few interesting nuggets here. And this is kind of really an interesting post that I think, um, you know, tells kind of the story, right? And, and you know, some of it is, um, you know, they're, they believe that um, the appointment of the board members sort of validated the confidence and they recognize that you know, the short positions are in at least some trouble because the stock price is going to go up and they're gonna to have to cover their positions. And there's kind of this other interesting thread here about how there's this nostalgia. And, and that might be why GameStop is kind of sort of this unique investment because um, a lot of uh, these younger, these, these traders, they, they have fond memories of going to these stores and buying their first PlayStation or um, you know, they, they know the name, they know the brand, and so they, um, in some ways, I think, um, have an attachment to it that you would not have with some obscure mining company that you've never really, you know, you've never actually gone to in, in person. Um, a couple days later, um, somebody posts this, which is a type of uh, brokerage uh, statement or uh, sort of a summary of your holdings in a brokerage account. And the person who posted this um, is a man named Keith Gill, um, who uh, was profiled in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few weeks ago as somebody who made a lot of money um, from, from this investment. Um, and so what, what he and others will do, and this is kind of what you see on these Reddit Wall Street bets boards, is that they will kind of show 
their statements to prove that they are holding stock and that they've made money on them. And, you know, you know, the important thing at the very bottom right hand corner is, you know, his stake has gone up to about $6 million, um, total gains of about $4 million here, single day, $2.6 million, right? This is going to get people's attention. Um, and, you know, to his credit, he's not somebody who came recently into GameStop. Like he's invested in this for a long time, uh, more than a year. And he's, at times his positions have not been very high. But one, one thing to note is he's, he's a big investor, right? He's put in, you know, the first line is the, the number of shares. He has 50,000 shares um, and he's paid $15 on average uh, for uh, these, these shares, um, it looks like. And so, you know, that's, that's a sizable chunk of somebody's, you know, retirement portfolio or any portfolio, right? He's, he's saying, you know, he's risking, you know, like $500,000 or so by my, my rough envelope calculation in a single stock with, with very few prospects. And, you know, that's how you make a lot of money as an investor, uh, but there's also a lot of risk, right? You could lose a lot of money as well. He's bought some call options in the second line um, you know, a thousand call, each call option can be exercised. My understanding is uh, you, it gives you the right to buy a hundred shares at a certain price. And so the first line is that he, had, he bought a $20 call, which means that he has the right to buy this stock, to pay $20 for this stock until January 15th when the option expires. And so it looks like he paid about seven cents a share for each of these options, and they've gone up to 1140. Um, and and so you know, options, as you know, th this is a way where you can, um, uh, you know, it's 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 normally a hedging technique um, where, you know, if you think that um, you need some protection if the price goes up, you might buy a call. You can also use it to sort of speculate because rather than paying fourteen dollars for a single share, you buy seven cents for the right to buy. At twenty dollars a share, and that becomes valuable because you know now, um, you know now it's there's a you know it's, it's it was trading at like thirty dollars a share, so you've realized eleven dollars on a seven cent, or, you know, a slightly more than that bet. Uh, so you know he does this also with the uh, these twelve dollar calls that expire in in April, um, and and this is where he's made you know a couple million dollars. So pe people see this, right? People see this, and so. It's it's not. I think this is kind of part of what's spurring uh, some of this activity. And we see another person a day later. Uh, thank you, DFE. That's his uh, his code name, uh, Keith Gill's code name for the best two days of work in my life. So he buys uh, 4,400 shares at $23. You know, that's 80, 100 thousand. That's a big bet. And and you consider the stock's already doubled, right? I mean, how many people go and buy? that much stock thinking it'll go up again when it's doubled already, but it doubled again. I, I wouldn't say it doubled, maybe it went up by like 50% or so. Um, and so he has a huge gain of around, uh, you know, about $85,000, $50,000 in a day. P people are seeing this, right? And yeah, this is very risky though. You're, 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 you're putting out a lot of money, real money. And, and I suspect you know a lot of people are putting out similar amounts or less, and it, it begins to add up, and it pushes the value of the stock up. Um, and this is kind of the new dynamic, right? It's the new dynamic where um, you know people can offer proof of, of sort of what they're they're earning. Um, there's also kind of a, a somewhat rational story about well, you know, this we've seen this before, right? We've seen companies just. Uh, skyrocket and Tesla is a nice example of this. If you had bought uh, at the beginning of 2020 for around $80 a share, you know it goes up by 10 times, right? 10 times that investment. And you hear some chatter in the boards about how I, I missed out on Tesla. I'm not going to do that again with with GameStop. And so there are these precedents I think that are kind of in people's minds that make them think, well, maybe this is going to keep going up and up. Part of Tesla's story is that. You know, there's there a short squeeze. A lot of short sellers lost money and were covering their positions over, um, over time. Um, squeezing the shorts, uh, Professor Verstein talked about short selling and uh, how that works. Um, so one of the dynamics of, of, of selling a, a stock short is you, you borrow this, this, the shares that you're selling and the person you borrow it from will often require you to, you to put up some money 
um, in case you run away and you know, leave town. Um, and, and so this is called the margin. Um, so if I sell $50,000 of stock short, then they may require me to put up 50% of that $25,000 to sort of uh, make sure that I'm around to sort of pay the money that's owed if the trade goes against me. And so what, what happens when the stock price goes up is that as, it, as the share price goes up and the trade turns against you and you're losing money, the person you borrowed the shares from uh, is going to increase the amount that they require you to put up as margin. And this can increase very significantly. Um, and so this is a, a case where you see that the price goes up by about 25% and you have to put up another, you basically have to double your margin, right? When it, when, when, the, when the stock price goes from 50 to 75, which is actually a 50% increase. So imagine if the stock price is doubling and then doubling again, right? The margin calls are going to get higher and higher. And so um, there's pressure on the people who sold short to close out their position and get out. How do they do that? Well, they have to go out into the market. They have to actually buy shares and replace the ones that they borrowed. But the market's going up already and then more people to cover the shorts are going in and buying more, um, that drives up the price even more. And that, you know, that's called, that's what the short squeeze is. You're, you're, you're increasing the pain on the shorts so their margin calls go up. And then at some point they give up, they have to cover their positions and they, they have to buy a bunch of shares at high prices in order to do this. They lose money and the stock price continues to go up. Um, you know, you see some talk of, you know, we're going to squeeze the shorts before the 19th, but what really stirs the pot is the 19th and 21st, one of the short sellers, Andrew Citrin, um, he posts a, a tweet. He basically calls everyone a sucker. You are suckers at this poker game. The stock's back at $20 fast. Um, we understand short interest better than you. And so, you know, some of the coverage in the press is that, you know, this is this, you know, the, the Reddit folks are evil and, and they just want to uh, they, they want to crush the short sellers. You know, the short sellers are not all that polite either. And they were kind of maybe provoking uh, the folks on Reddit. Um, you know, the Jan January 21st, he, you know, gives a, a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a video, a YouTube video on, on his position. And, and then you see a lot of chatter about, about this and how angry people are. And then it really becomes kind of part of the cause. January 26, linking this back to Tesla, Tesla, Elon Musk, you know, you know, uh, sort of touts the stock, and a lot of people see this. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, uh, Keith, uh, Keith uh, Gill posts another uh, screenshot. His position is now up to 22 million dollars. 22 million dollars. I mean, just an extraordinary amount. You know, 20 million dollars in uh, the course of a, a couple of weeks. And you know, he's held on to the stock. He's taken a lot of risk, but you know, you can see people seeing this and, and just getting, you know, the, the mania keeps sort of uh, going, going forward and um, it gets hard to control. What happened to Citroen? Well, they say they covered at about uh, $90 a share at a loss of 100%. They lost a, a significant amount. They got out though before it got up to 150 and then 300 and 400 dollars and so forth. Um, so, you know, most I think folks sort of say that this is a combination of a short squeeze and retail investors and the dynamic of Reddit. There is kind of a somewhat dissenting view that, you know, maybe, maybe it was more about hedge funds and institutional investors were more involved than previously believed. And so there's an interesting story on CNBC on Friday. Um, and, and one of the points they make is actually that GameStop, if you look at the the, the sort of the, the stocks that were traded the most in terms of buy orders, GameStop, GameStop is not on the top 10. It's actually number 13 uh, for the month of January. And there are all these other stocks that were traded more. I actually think that's not a great point because GameStop stock float is actually very small relative to all these other companies that were in the top 10. And so, you know, naturally, if you have a bigger stock float, you have just more activity. Um, and so, I, I don't think that's kind of a uh, something that refutes the theory that it was retail investors that were driving GameStop up. But but, but you know, part of the the point here is that you know short squeeze is more possible for a company with uh, a small public float. That's the amount of stock that is owned by public investors as opposed to insiders that are available to trade. And these you know price price changes to some extent are facilitated by the fact that it is pretty small in terms of the number of shares available, right? 47 million versus 
you know, 17 billion for Apple. Even AMC, which has also uh, had a lot of activity, has twice the number of shares available as GameStop. And you see that it's, it's really a minnow among uh, whales. You know, GameStop is not even in the S&P 500. And so, um, you know, that, that's important, I think, to keep in mind as we thought, think about policy considerations. Another chart is that retail trading flows seem to have dropped around the time when the stock price was going up. I don't think that really refutes the idea, though, that retail investors, to some extent, were driving a lot of this. I mean, there still is a, you know, it goes from about 50 percent to around 42 percent. Um, you know, 42 percent is still a substantial amount of retail trading activity. And I suspect what's happening on the 26th and 27th is that, you know, there are there are some hedge funds that got in early, and there's a report of, you know, there's one hedge fund that made 700 million dollars, so they're actually selling into this market. And, and earning you know, huge returns from earlier investments. Um, also, I think there's greater institutional activity as people are covering their shorts um, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, hedging if they sell, they're selling call options and so forth. So, um, so I do think the retail uh, aspect of it is, is uh, important and it's not just institutional uh, traders though we will not necessarily know exactly what um, until more study can be done. Uh, so and now I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrew to talk about some of the legal implications. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, also, won't it be fun someday when we get to do the further study? That'll be fun. We'll be able to look back on this talk and just think we were there. We were all here together for it. So legal implications. Whenever something weird happens in the market, everyone wants to say who goes to jail or something. And in this case, uh, um, the main facts don't involve someone going to jail, probably. Uh, and what I've just said out loud, uh, which is which is uh, that most of what we've just described is legal and is not violative of any uh, law, I'll, I'll add some complications along the way. And some of those are things you're probably not hearing uh, from every uh, pundit yet. Um, so uh, a smattering of things people want to know. Um, Reddit users are upset at Robinhood for freezing their buy orders, and that's probably fine. The contract clearly says Robinhood can do that, and Robinhood had a perfectly good reason for doing that. It wasn't just to save GameStop from shorts or help Game, you know, whatever, whatever that I mean, to, from uh, from from the high stock price or something. You know, Robinhood is a brokerage. They they are facing uh, requirements from their clearinghouse. Their clearinghouse is the back office that helps them to actually move stock around and make sure that. Uh, trades are executed. Clearinghouses, um, just like uh, Professor Park was talking about with option, uh, with, with short positions that require margin, clearinghouses require you to have collateral on hand uh, because there's, there's always the possibility that a brokerage or one of its customers will fail before they deliver stock or deliver cash. It's a perfectly ordinary requirement that a clearinghouse would require people to put money uh, in the account there so that if they uh, if they disappear in the two days before the stock is delivered or the stock is purchased, that there's money to, to help the other clearinghouse members to deal with the, with the calamity. Uh, this is thought to be a pretty benign aspect of market structure and market microstructure. And, uh, it, but, but it, has, it can have unexpected consequences. So if a clearinghouse requires collateral on hand that approximates what the likely losses are from its customers, well, this has been a wild month. Two months and um, a clearinghouse would rationally say customers are more likely to go bankrupt now than they were three months ago. We need more collateral from every single customer, including Robinhood. Perfectly rational thing for a clearinghouse to conclude, uh, and and generally speaking, uh, uh, an appropriate uh, thing for them to do. So totally within the clearinghouse's rights to ask for more money, and that's why Robinhood has to get some more money before they buy any more stock on behalf of their customers. They can't increase their position with the clearinghouse until they put up more collateral. They don't have a good line of credit available because they're an upstart firm. Maybe they should have planned ahead and had more cash on hand, but you don't get to be Robin Hood by being you know, really responsible. You know, they're, you're, they're a brash upstart that tries to upset the whole system and they're going in as fast as they can. And so they don't have the cash they need to, uh, fix the, uh, to fix the hole in their collateral requirements. Other people do. So they're not tied up. People are upset that rich Wall Street hedge funds continued to trade during this period because they had a, a plan for how they were going to pony up more collateral when it was called for. Robinhood 
got money pretty fast. They got it in a couple of days, which is very fast for, for somebody who didn't have a plan. Uh, but, uh, but there's nothing sinister here and there's nothing illegal here. Um, though, as with each of these slides, I'm happy to talk to you about it some more. Yeah, so you know, collateral requirements went across, up across the market by $7 billion and Robinhood was among those who had to put in money and they, they simply didn't have their appropriate share yeah, so I don't, I don't see anything here that's really uh, implicatory or troublesome. Uh, there's more to say about Robinhood, of course. I mean, you know, everyone noticed in this incident that Robinhood had uh, a business that uh, pays for itself through stock lending and payment through order flow, payment for order flow. Uh, we're not talking about payment for order flow today in our panel. It's an interesting, controversial practice that, that underwrites Robinhood's business, but there, there's not a serious argument that that played any role in this that, that deserves attention or that was illegal. So I don't see any legal risk for Robin Hood in this story, though I'm happy to talk to you guys about it if you wanna talk about that some more. The second group that people wanna grab by the lapels is the short selling community and say, maybe these hedge funds are or were breaking the law. And again, it's just, it's really hard on the facts that we have to find anything like that. People wanna say that um, the hedge funds were, the short sellers were engaged in naked shorting, uh, which would be, uh, which is even more aggressive than the, than the uh, coat example with the Ritz I gave earlier. Imagine that instead of borrowing the coat from the Ritz and then selling it, you simply went on eBay and advertised a coat for sale and you haven't even borrowed the coat. Um, that's pretty aggressive. It's pre pretty brazen. Uh, the theory is, well, if somebody buys it, I'll find a coat. That's brazen. Okay, um, the law restricts naked short selling, but we have no evidence that widespread naked short selling occurred. And we also, the, the way that it restricts it is pretty softball and you're allowed to engage in naked short selling as long as you determine that you'd be able to fill the short position if needed, which is a pretty soft requirement. Um, there's some ambiguity on, on how soft it is. And so in theory, a person could get in trouble for violating that if, but we don't have any indication that someone did and it would be, it would be blazing new ground to really establish that what they did was 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 uh, was violative. So not not a serious uh, argument for on our facts for for wrongdoing. Likewise, people want to um, say that maybe the short sellers were um, uh, breaking the law by not making their positions clear. They're kind of sneaking and skulking about trying to build and and then dissolve their positions. And we just don't have serious disclosure requirements for short sellers in the society. Maybe we should, I'm a co-author of a proposal to the SEC that we should increase disclosure requirements for short sellers, but, uh, but that isn't law. And also if it were, I don't think it would have solved anything in this story really. I mean, I think um, uh, greater disclosure from short sellers would have, uh, if anything, made the bubble wilder made it go, uh, go up higher for its brief moment in the stars because it would have made it easier to short squeeze the shorts, which is of course the weird technical thing that made the stratoscopic prices uh, possible. Um, the final group to talk about is the Redditors. Uh, some folks, not the Redditors, but some folks wanna say that maybe the Redditors were breaking various laws. And to be sure, there may be things that were violated. Uh, some of these people, you know, Raging Kitty was is a, is a licensed financial advisor or something, and there may be laws against uh, running this kind of uh, 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 bucket shop out of your out of your computer at night if you have a regulated industry job. That's not my point. But market manipulation. People want to say, is the Reddit game a market manipulation game, or conversely, I suppose, is the game by the short sellers a market manipulation game? And here again, um, the orthodox view, and I, I largely subscribe to it, is that there isn't a serious risk of market manipulation here. Though I'm going to. I'm going to show that it's less uh, it's less cut and dry than people typically think. So there's three good theories for how you can tag someone with market manipulation under our securities laws. Uh, one is Section 9A2, which is the part of our securities laws that is in, of, of the Securities Act, uh, Exchange Act of 1934 that is intended to deal with market manipulation. Here is the text, and um, uh, it is the the drafters of the law thought this was going to be our tool for stopping market manipulation. So it wouldn't surprise you that you might hold this up and say, maybe the Redditors are violating it with their like pushing the stock up. But the trouble is 9A2 has been, uh, is written in such a way uh, and developed in such a way that it was basically dead letter. There are very few 9A2 um, uh, enforcement actions uh, in American history. They don't go well. Um, 
One of the reasons is that um, it requires a very specific set of facts. Um, the, the manipulator has to uh, create trading uh, with, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, raise or lower the price and, and for the purpose of inducing purchase or sale by others. And that last clause is actually harder to prove than you might expect. You might say, well, of course, the, of course the Redditors were hoping to induce purchase or sale. They were trying to drive the price up, but, um, but you know, maybe they were happy to have the same amount of sales and purchases just at a higher price. So are they actually asking for new purchases or sales or the same purchases or sales, but at a different price? It, it just, it's very hard to tie this down to a particular transaction. And so prosecutors and regulators have essentially ignored 9A2 from the start. And instead they developed our manipulation jurisprudence under, section, under rule 10B5, section 10B and rule 10B5. This is our catch-all. This is what we use for insider trading. It's what we use for typical securities fraud cases. This is what we use for everything. It's the workhorse of a regulator or a DOJ uh, case. And, um, and it, it can cover market manipulation, um, but, uh, and the statute uh, uses the word manipulation, but it, uh, it, it proves difficult because the main line of, of 10B5 actions against market manipulation are, are, are getting tangled up in the requirement of fraud or deceit. So uh, 10B5 is a catch-all, but what it catches must be fraud. And if you're looking for fraud, um, you, know, you might find it on these facts. Maybe some Redditors were posting things that were um, false. They were saying, you know, it's going to 1,000 per share and I won't sell until it does but that person is secretly planning to sell at 90. Maybe they've already sold out their position entirely. They've lied to you on a message board, uh, or they say, oh, I heard a secret that Janet Yellen's going to bail out games. If you, don't, if you haven't heard that and you're just fibbing, well, that's a fine little 10B5. And, and the SEC has no trouble prosecuting someone for that. But I don't think there's an argument that that's a lot of the GameStop story. So it'd be, it's, it's, that's not where you wanna hang your hat if you're looking for some kind of law. Uh, some violation. So then the question is, can we find a 10b5 violation without mean message board posts or something, uh, just when people buy and sell in a really weird and aggressive fashion, okay? Or when somebody tries to exploit a short position, they say that short position is so big, I bet we can squeeze them. Let's squeeze them, okay? And then we'll be able to make money off the short squeeze. Is that a violation of 10b5? Well, it's certainly not a violation like the other kinds of violations where you lie. You didn't speak at all, okay? Can you lie without speaking? Okay, well, actually there's a circuit split about these open market cases. There are courts that have said, no, if you merely buy and sell and your trades are basically lawful trades, um, the fact that you were hoping to squeeze the shorts or that you were hoping to create a weird price out there, an artificial price, that is not a violation of the law because there's no trickery involved and 10b5 catches fraud. Other courts have said, no, if you intend to create an artificial price, that bad intent can spoil and taint your otherwise lawful trades. And you can be a, a, a market manipulator, okay? Liable for market manipulation. I guess the theory is that by buying stock at $500 a share, you're kind of representing to the market that you think that's an appropriate price for it. And if your game is really just market manipulation, then that's kind of a deceptive purchase, kind of miscommunicates your investment motives, okay? Um, uh, and then uh, more courts still are in between and just say, look, we're not really sure what the current state of the law is. This is pretty complicated. So um, uh, for me, you hear that the risk to Redditors is slightly higher than what you're gonna hear from other columnists, but, uh, but it's still not a huge risk because it, uh, the SEC would be breaking new ground to bring a lot of these random people in if they were to take up the challenge. Uh, um, the, but the final thing I wanna say about this market manipulation business is it is surprising to many people how weak the SEC's options are for pursuing market manipulation cases uh, on facts like this. Uh, it's surprising. And one of the reasons that it's surprising is people have in mind other manipulation laws that actually work the way you think they might work. So Redditors are moving on to silver right now. Silver ain't stock. You're buying silver futures, silver call options. Uh, if you're buying positions in uh, commodity pools trading silver, you are not subject to our securities laws. America bifurcates its investment laws 
And you're going now under the Commodity Exchange Act of 1936. It has different rules. Notice this is section 9A2 of a different law. We started out with 9A2 of the Securities uh, of the Securities uh, Exchange Act of 1934. Now we're at 9A2, another 9A2 from a different 1930s era investment law that actually reads differently. So this is the one that would govern um, uh, people who are trying to bid up silver. Uh, and this text reads a little differently. Um, it specifically calls out, I uh, kind of jumped a little, um, efforts to manipulate the price of a commodity. It doesn't require fraud. It actually uses the word corner, which is most courts will tell you a corner and a squeeze are functionally the same thing. So it calls out, and, and elsewhere in the statute, they, uh, it, it, it makes clear that it's, it, it's interested in squeezes and short squeezes, uses those words. So in silver, there's actually a market manipulation statute, um, a prohibition that doesn't require fraud and that specifically identifies squeezes and short squeezes as as illegal, okay? Um, and so if Redditors do the same thing with GameStop they did with silver, they will be in legal hot water because our market manipulation laws for uh, commodities uh, just focus on creating an artificial price, not on creating a tricky artificial price or a fraudulent artificial price. Now, I leave it to you to ask, do you like one better? Would you like market manipulation to be illegal when it's tricky or when it's market manipulation you know, that's a policy question, but we've split our law at a seam and, uh, and the Redditors are crossing that Rubicon right now without even noticing it and moving on to a very different legal environment, one that's much more hostile to their cause. Um, now, uh, Professor Park and I are gonna begin to close and then go to questions. I'll just say for my takeaways from this, there are a lot of takeaways, there's a million takeaways, but one of them is that financial plumbing matters. Collateral requirements are driving a lot of what's happening at Robinhood. Shorting mechanisms are why you're able to create such a technically high price is by squeezing the shorts. Um, you know, those, those are things people ignore. People don't always know about the back office of stock trading, but it makes big differences in the real world whenever you note it whenever you have cause to notice it. Legal regime matters. The fact that we um, that uh, senators from red states have uh, have the agricultural committees, uh, and so they hold on to the laws governing commodities means that we have very different laws for very similar financial financial instruments, uh, and so we're going to get very different results um, from the same from similar facts depending on what asset is traded on Robinhood. Um, and you know we also just need to like. Be careful of what narratives we take up. Short sellers uh, do good and bad things, and it's very easy to, to hate them, but uh, we, should, we should look at the facts of the story uh, in any case, and, uh, and, and that's something we should do. Okay, Professor Park, back to you, and then, um, and then for the floor. I'll be just very brief um, in terms of uh, potential policy uh, implications. Um, you know, one is I think we should really uh, think about uh, private ordering solutions to uh, some of these uh, these issues, Robinhood in particular, could potentially have some influence here. And, and one modest proposal is I think they should re rethink uh, the no commission trades um, to some extent and, and make some of the cost a little bit more uh, to, to frequent trading um, a little bit more apparent to small investors. I don't, I don't know if that would have helped with game stock, but if, if you're, you know, if you're paying a little bit for each trade rather than having no commission trades, then um, that, that could make a difference. Um, you might also think about um, the way Robinhood enrolls people and, and allows them to invest in sophisticated products. Um, you know, is, is there a way to sort of slow sort of somebody from immediately uh, trading in options and, and so forth? I'm not sure if there's some, 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 some uh, measures that could be put into place uh, by, uh, by the company. Um, you know, secondly, I think the SEC, uh, to the extent it's not doing this, has to be really um, sort of on top of these message boards, YouTube, social media, and be more preemptive, right? To the extent that you see misleading information uh, that's, that's being produced, um, maybe, uh, maybe the SEC could act a little bit more preemptively and bring injunctions and other types of uh, actions rather than waiting for a, a crisis to act. Um, and then my final point um, with respect to big picture uh, sort of takeaways is, is, is I hope the lesson for the young folks, the students uh, today is, is not that the stock market is dangerous and that it's something that I should avoid. Um, there are strong reasons to have, uh, when you get to the point where you have some savings, there are strong reasons to invest part of that in 
uh, the stock market and products that you understand, um, you know, diversified index funds, uh, you know, bonds and so forth. Uh, you can make a big difference in, in your life, your economic future, if you uh, are putting money in a 401k or a Roth IRA over uh, time and it, it grows over time. Um, you know, one a useful piece of advice uh, I, would, I, would, I would give um, is that rather, you know, if you have $1,000 to invest, don't put it into the market all at once, spread it out, you know, from time, you know, over a year, um, you know, what, what's called cost dollar averaging so that, you know, if, if you pay a little bit too much for stocks at one point in time, maybe the next month you'll pay a little bit less. Um, and that can uh, significantly reduce uh, the risk of investing in stock markets. Uh, I, I agree with those comments. And I'm going to take up uh, George's question from the chat. And if anyone else wants to jump in. Uh, so George asked, what about uh, financial transactions tax? Like, you know, we you pay a penny for trade or something to the government. Like a, we call those sometimes a token tax. Um, uh, or a restoration of the uptick rule, which is a rule that said you can't short a stock unless it's going up. OK. Um, and so it's meant to prevent uh, free fall from from going on. To my mind, you know, I'm not attracted to those two things. Um, uh, for one thing, the transaction tax, people who propose transaction taxes usually are proposing transaction taxes that are quite small, uh, small on a per trade basis, but that add up if you're making millions of trades a day, if you're a high frequency trader, a computerized algorithmic trader, you know, an, a hundredth of a penny per trade would bankrupt you as such a trader, okay? Um, and that, you know, some people like that idea and some people don't like that idea, but I don't see any evidence that this interesting story was driven in any way by high frequency traders trading a lot. Uh, they're just, that isn't part of this story as far as I can tell. And so the main effect of a realistic transaction tax is to attack high frequency trading, but this is just not a story about that. So you can like or dislike that tax, but I don't see anything here that pushes it. And likewise, the uptick rule, you know, it's, the uptick rules classic application is like you've got a company that's really just falling for no reason. The short sellers keep on pushing on it and attacking it and battering it. And you know, that's just not these facts. This this is a stock that has had some up and down, and short sellers would be able to short when in, in its good days. And uh, uh, so I, I don't I don't see it making a huge difference in a case like this personally. But I I will take the invitation of those two things for both of those things. Um, my answer uh, was, was tacitly like, be careful what you wish for. You know, if you put a transaction tax on, um, you know, that's going to attack a very different type of behavior than we're talking about. And, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of be careful what you wish for in these stories. So let, let, me, let me identify one thing that I hear a lot. I hear a lot that people are mad that the hedge funds could trade liberally while, while, while Main Street couldn't. Okay. And that's, that's a thing that we hear. And you know, by the way, there has been a, 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 a view for a long time that maybe hedge funds ought to be more available to Main Street. Maybe Main Streeters should be allowed to buy in. But you know, most people have opposed that. Most people thought that hedge funds are dangerous. And in fact, these hedge funds, two of them went bankrupt on our watch, basically, lost all, you know, like be careful, you know, do you want to have a democratic financial system where everyone can play with every product, or do you want people to not get burned? This goes to last the comment, la the last comment by Professor Park that if you discourage um, you know, if you if you if you have a democratic app that lets everyone buy stock options, then they will. But a lot of them will get burned. And so, you, you, what do you want? You know, do you want to have everybody able to get everything, and so no one's mad at Robinhood because they can get in and they can get into the hedge funds and they can always trade, or or do you want to have prudential regulation that uh, uh, protects people from their own mistakes? You know, uh, every society has to make their own tra trade offs. But you, you know, you got to be careful what you wish for because you're not always going to get you. There's not, there's not a perfect spot that, that presents itself. Just to follow up briefly on that, um, I did notice New York State has proposed a type of uh, transaction tax on, on stocks, which is very interesting. And I, I don't know if that will gain any more momentum because of recent events. Um, the other thing George's comment um, reminds me of is that um, you know, often it's the hedge funds, the short, short sellers who are accused of spreading misinformation. And, um, and so I kind of wonder, is it really in the interest of short sellers for the SEC to go in and really, you know, root out um, uh, sort of the sort of uh, misleading information? Because, you know, sometimes hedge funds may do that as well. Um, you know, the Redditors are getting criticized a lot for kind of joining together. But, 
you know, hedge funds, they sometimes sponsor dinners where people float ideas and the hope is to get other hedge funds interested as well. And so, you know, is it, is it really all that different than um, what happens among sophisticated investors? I think that, you know, that's something to think about too. All right, Jim, can I expand on that a little bit? Sure, George. How, you know, part of the reason to have options in first place, this is a years ago, I've been trading options for quite a while, uh, was not so much a speculative device, but as a hedging device. You know, you want to take a long position because you believe in something, but you, because you're a responsible fiduciary, you, you've, got to, you've got to responsibly hedge. And options were viewed as a very low cost efficient way of doing that. And I think that piece of it's got to be preserved, which is why I raised the point about uh, a transactions tax, because it, it, given the size of uh, options contract, that may be, I, I agree with Andrew that, that they are pennies, but uh, in the course of things, given the size of the options contract, they may have a bit of a chilling effect as well. Um, I think in the case of New York, transaction tax makes sense because they are raising money from the HFC guys, or the high frequency trader guys, and uh, that's gonna raise money. So, so I have a question, uh, given Andrew. Um, let's assume for a moment that, and you've sort of made the case that uh, short selling has uh, value in the market generally that we should um, uh, allow short selling in the uh, American market system. Um, if you were advising me as a uh, hedge fund that engages in short selling, um, would, you, would you advise me to continue short selling right now? Or would you suggest that maybe I lay low with that strategy because there's gonna be more of this in the next six months to a year? And I don't know which stock they're going to pick. And so I'm now subject to being squeezed in a way that um, wasn't true six months ago. Yeah, I mean, look, short sellers are smart people and, and they, um, they make mistakes, but they also are, are preparing. And I'm sure they're preparing without my advising them to prepare. Um, but I would advise them to prepare. You know, part of the reason that 9A2 is so ineffective um, for our securities regime is that it was written at a time that people really didn't think common stock was susceptible to squeezes. Bonds, sure. Commodities, sure. But common stock of publicly traded companies was not supposed to be the kind of thing that a squeeze occurred. And so they didn't write a market manipulation law that was meant to deal with squeezes. Well, it turns out that you might be able to squeeze a publicly traded company. If everybody is uh, happy to hop on social media for a day, you could have a wandering mob that does that for a little bit. And that's like a new fact. It may not happen all that often. We don't know what it'll end up looking like, but uh, you'd, be, you'd be foolish. People ask whether um, the hedge funds were foolish to have more shares shorted than there were outstanding shares. Well, that's risky. But it's a risk people were willing to bear for a long time because what are the odds that someone's going to buy all the shares and say no to you? You know that's that's a that's a risk, but it's a bearable risk because we didn't see a lot of short squeezes with with common stock in human history. Well, it turns out now you might see short squeezes with common stock, and you've got to build that into your model, and you you've got to be more uh, careful with your uh, with your squeezes. Uh, presumably, the trouble also means that there will be uh, richer returns for the successful. Uh, short sellers because some people are going to be more reluctant and and so the the gains will be greater for the fruit that you can pluck but uh, but it's it's a it's a dangerous game. Yeah, and I think um, you know even if you do sell short, are you going to publicize your position and and get harassed and uh, vilified? Um, I, I think that's that's something that. Um, you know that that I think uh, is an unfortunate development because if if, if information is too positive going in one direction, then, you know, that, that may make markets more conducive to bubbles. And, and so I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's dangerous to sell short um, in times like this when momentum is going a certain way. You know, you could be right in the long run, but not 
you know, not be successful um, because uh, the short run, you know, the markets are just not acting um, rationally. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I do feel like we probably are in some type of bubble, um, but whether or not there's a way to really take advantage of that is, is uncertain. We have a comment in the chat, and then we should probably take Fernand and Charles together because I think we lose at 1.30, leave at 1.30. Ethan asks about whether this challenges the efficient markets hypothesis. And you know, it's not a good day for stock prices for efficiency, right? This is not a good month for one stock. And so if this happened a lot for a lot of stocks for long periods of time, it would be a real sign that either theory needs to adjust or more realistically that markets need to be fixed. Because you want, like the efficient markets hypothesis isn't a law of nature that stock prices are always good. It's, it's that under ideal conditions, they will have certain desirable properties. And those conditions may or may not obtain. And facts like how short selling can lead to squeezes, those technical byproducts of market plumbing are not something the efficient markets hypothesis has a view about. You know, it's our job. As, as experts to try to craft a market that doesn't have lots of really weird, unexpected problems. And if we do our job right, then stock prices will be acceptably efficient. Uh, but you know, at least for one stock for one month, we see evidence that our stock market could be uh, better designed. You know, I think if the efficient markets hypothesis recognizes some of some markets are more efficient than others. And you know, you have a company with a small public float, it's going to be different than trading in Apple or, or some other company with many more public shares available, more could go wrong. Um, and, and, you know, S&P, it's not part of, GameStop was not part of the S&P 500. Um, and that, you know, maybe um, an argument that, you know, until we see this happen in larger stocks, um, I'm not sure that uh, this really challenges um, our belief that um, our capital markets are, uh, are, are efficient. Charles? I know you guys spoke about this earlier, but I wanted to make sure I was understanding. What was the reason Robinhood couldn't um, restrict selling and buying instead of just selling? I mean, instead of just buying. They could have restricted just selling if they wanted to, um, but uh, they didn't want to because they wanted to say no to fewer people. And, uh, and also, you know, selling reduces the um, total position of Robinhood's customers. So Robinhood is being billed by the clearinghouse for how much stock Robinhood is, uh, 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 is, is moving through that clearinghouse. And if they have net sales, then, uh, then they're, they're reducing the total footprint at the clearinghouse. Um, but you could, in a different market, the opposite could be true. You know, in a, in, in a very different market, they might be. Uh, they might have been required to restrict sales because that's the direction that they're uh, creating a footprint. So it's um, uh, maybe that wasn't the clearest way of putting it. Jim, Jim, do you have a better way of putting it than than I put no, it? No, I think I think you your your point is 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 uh, explanation is a good one. Yeah, that was a great um, that was a great explanation. I was um, and then my 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 second question was going to be. I know um, Professor Park spoke about adding on maybe um, a charge for each trade. And one thing that I know that some like out of um, the country brokers do things like that. But one of the things that I found kind of um, difficult about um, going that route would be that you would push, I believe, a good portion of people out of the market just yeah. due to things like the PDT rule. Like I trade using TD Ameritrade. And the only reason why I do it is because it's zero commissions. Um, and I'm still under the PDT rule so it seems like if I only get three trades and then you take money off of it, three day trades, because that's what most people in this situation are doing, three day trades and you take off that um, extra percent, it would kind of effectively bar me from even wanting to do it until I have $25,000, which may be a good thing, but I'm assuming we want people in the market. It, it's, a good, it's a good point. It's tough to balance those considerations. And I, I do think that um, you know individual investors have advantages at times over institutional investors because you can buy and sell just a few shares. You don't move the market, um, and and I, I personally, you know, I have a small portfolio of individual stocks, um, and I I do think I trade them more ever since they got rid of of commissions. Um, but you know, there are alternatives such as you know mutual funds. As you know, don't charge commissions. And you know, if if I was a if if I was a dictator, I might 
you know, want to push more people in that direction. But I, I think your, your point is, is well taken. So we've uh, hit our wall of 1.30. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Park and Professor Burstein for just actually a terrific um, program and great explanation, a lot to think about. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for attending and we'll see you soon. Thanks. And Thanks I, I saw a hand there. I'll stick around for a second if anybody wants to chat for a few minutes just in the, in the virtual classroom for a couple of minutes after we're done. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks.